I want to ask you a really important question. Who is the greatest novelist of our time? Now, if you read a lot of novels every year and you keep up to date with who's hot and who isn't, I'm sure you have your own ideas. But the real debate is what exactly is greatness? What is the criteria? Now, since the death of uh, Philip Roth in 2018, my criteria regarding what makes a great novelist has changed. Uh, right now, to me, the greatest novelist of our time is Hilary Mantel. They say that success leaves clues. When we're talking about greatness, uh, all that success an author has achieved uh, give us so many lessons about life and the way that a person has learned that craft. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the five lessons that I learned. I'm also turning this into an original tag. What you have to do is as follows. Who is your greatest novelist of the moment? And what are the five lessons that you learned from him or her? And then tag five other booktubers who might also do the same exercise. Now, if you're not a YouTuber, you can still do this exercise. Watch this video and then in the comment section, tell me who's your greatest novelist and what, what are the lessons that you can learn, not just about the craft of writing, but also about life itself. For me, the greatest novelist of our time is Dame Hilary Mantel. And the five lessons that I learned from her are ones that might be useful to you. So those five lessons coming right up. The first lesson I learned from Hilary Mantel is to make sweet uses of adversity. Now, Shakespeare, in As You Like It, says sweet are the uses of adversity. And interestingly enough, uh, the life of uh, Hilary Mantel has something in common with Herman Melville, one of the greatest novelists in the canon of American literature. Melville, uh, in a conversation with Nathaniel Hawthorne, another great novelist, said that um, until the age of 25, he didn't achieve anything. And he said, I date my life from the age of 25. If Herman Melville had died at the age of 25, the world would have, wouldn't have mattered. The, nobody in the world would have cared. Now, in the case of Hilary Mantel, if she had died at the age of 32, no, not many people would have cared. We wouldn't be having this conversation now. However, in the case of Herman Melville and Hilary Mantel, the life they led until the age of 25 in the case of Melville and until the age of 32 in the case of uh, Hilary Mantel are really important. Now, if you read um, Hilary Mantel's memoir, you would read that she had a really challenging childhood and then a 20s, uh, in her 20s, she suffered so much pain. Age of 27, after suffering from years of physical pain and emotional pain, went to hospital and she said in a New Yorker article that she came out of the hospital minus her womb, her ovaries, bits of bladder, bits of uh, bowel and minus a future, especially with regards to having children. Now, this is a really important moment in the life of Hilary Mantel because most of the people would have given up hope of many things, but not Hilary Mantel. If anything, she became more determined. And she. this was a great example of someone making sweet uses of adversity. And from the age of 27 to 33, Hilary Mantel was busy writing. She wrote her first novel about the French Revolution, which was rejected, but that didn't stop her. She wrote her next novel, Every Day is Mother's Day, and that was published in 1985. But in those years, she was also suffering from addiction, especially addiction to barbiturates. Now, in the 1970s and early 80s, a lot of people who were diagnosed with insomnia or anxiety were given barbiturates, and that became an addiction. In her memoir, she talks about how how uh, after giving up uh, barbiturates, she buried herself into work, uh, especially at, at the time she had a, a job. She had two jobs and she worked six days a week. But every time she had, she was working on novels. And, and this is, again, is a great example of someone who's turning every adversity into something positive. In an interview for a TV in Norway, Hilary Mantel has said that if it hadn't been for the illness that deprived her of so many things uh, that makes, that allows for a normal life, she wouldn't have sought writing as the only thing that she could do. We really do have a great 
great example of somebody who's been presented with so much adversity, but she really has decided to turn that one great talent that she had into something that could change her life and then eventually have a big impact on millions of other people. The second lesson is be patient and live for deferred gratification. Now, there's a great passage in Nabokov's novel Pale Fire where he says writers should see the world, pluck its peaches and figs and not keep constantly meditating in a tower of yellow ivory. Not meditating in a tower of yellow ivory is really important because Hilary Mantel, despite having all these adversities, she lived a, a, a real life full of challenges. She she lived in Africa. She lived in the Middle East. She held two jobs. All throughout that time, she was learning a lot. One of the issues that I observed with a lot of aspiring writers of our generation is that they're so busy reading and reading and reading, but they don't really lead a really rich life that could then uh, give them, allow them the experiences that are important, especially horrible experiences, negative, challenging experiences. And one of the lessons that I learned from uh, Hilary Mantel is that you need to have your heart broken. You need to suffer a lot of losses and pains. So then when you get to the age of 30, you're in a confident state with regards to maybe not about life, but about your craft, about your art. Now, this relates to a lot of uh, things that Cyril Connolly famously said way back uh, over 50 years ago, which is that uh, a writer has to be at least 30 years old before he or she can produce something worth reading. And uh, in our generation, uh, Robert McKee, the great screenwriting coach, always says uh, to his students that you need to be at least 30 years old before you write anything of any value. Although he, he, he was generalizing, there are always exceptions, especially in genre novels like uh, science fiction or fantasy or some comedy. But in general, you have to be 30 years old. That's the theory that, that's the observation made by Cyril Connolly and Robert McKee. But I would say the same thing. Uh, Hilary Mantel so a rich life meant that she was able to uh, appreciate uh, all the things she has. They say that gratitude can be a form of superpower. By the time she got to the age of 32, uh, she is poised to have a life that's so productive as a writer because she's really grateful for the things that she already has. So many other people would have complained about the things that she that they haven't got. And in the memoir, again, she discusses how she doesn't want anyone to feel pity for her because she found a way to make a living as a writer. Until, until Wolf Hall, of course, she had to struggle. She was a struggling mid-list author, but she always found a way to make the written word pay for. Now, Hilary Mantel's life is also about patience and deferred gratifications. Uh, and um, she has talked about recently about how even in the 1970s, she knew that she was destined to write novels about Thomas Cromwell, but she had to live a life and to get the apprenticeship done. And she was patient. And this reminds me a lot about another great artist who was also learning his craft in the 1970s, and that's Bruce Springsteen. Now, in his autobiography, he talks about how uh, when he was starting out, he didn't want to be just like all the other rock stars of that generation that he was studying and watching. And, and, and the problem with that generation is that they burned out. Whereas he knew really earlier on that he's going to study all the great but at the same time, it's going to put a lot of time into learning the craft so then he can have a really long life. And now that we know that Springsteen, even now in the 2020s, is still producing music that is still relevant. So that's the big lesson that we, we should, as artists, we should live uh, with a lot of patience and for deferred gratification because a lot of great things take time to achieve. The third lesson is do it for the sense of progress, not for prizes or awards or sales figures or any vanity metrics. Now, Hilary Mantel uh, has been prolific. She has said in many interviews that she's she never really suffers from writer's block. She's a writing factory. And the reason for that is that she her main job, she says, is this sentence. It's all about writing this sentence, this scene this chapter and this book. 
That's all she cares about. That, those are the things over which you have any control, really. So, and it's all about the process and it's all about making sure that you're evolving, that you're progressing in your craft. So with this mindset, she has been successful. Now, until 2009, she wasn't commercially successful, but she still managed to be productive and innovative with the novels that she was writing. Now, there's a lot of research done on this to do uh, about in internal validation versus external validation. Now, if you live for external validation, such as prizes and awards and sales figures and money and all the vanity metrics, then it is likely that you might still achieve success, but you're not going to be happy on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and you might suffer all sorts of psychological problems. Whereas if you live for internal validation, as in the day-to-day -day living, it's about living for this moment and getting the work done right now. And the goal is to just immerse yourself in the process. Then not only are you going to be productive, that you will then achieve a lot of external success. Now, this is a subject that... Um, Alice Flaherty tackles in this book, Midnight Disease. And she has studied a lot of great artists, especially novelists. And she has found that those who are hyperprolific, and the term she uses is hypergraphia. This is a, a condition in which the patient uh, wants to write all the time. Uh, and they're doing it for internal validation. Now, there are lots of extreme examples, but there are some also good examples of great novelists who had hypergraphia. These include uh, Anthony Trollope, John Updike, uh, Balzac, um, J Joyce Carol Oates, uh, and many others, Stephen King. So, and we can include uh, Hilary Mantel in this category because regardless of whatever adversity that she had to face, she kept on writing. And the reason for that is that she's doing it for intrinsic motivation, as Alice Flaherty would say, or internal validation, That, which is a term that I favor, which is that, that seems a lot more emotive. So if you do it for internal validation, such as just as the joy in the process of, of writing a novel, writing a play, writing a screenplay, or making a video, then the real prize is in that process. Now, I know that's a, that bit is cliched. At the same time, you will find a lot of improvement in yourself as an artist. But if you keep looking at external uh, factors, then it's likely you can become blocked or demoralized or unproductive. So that's the really important lesson. The fourth lesson I learned from Hilary Mantel is write what you don't know. Yeah, write what you don't know. One of the cliche pieces of advice that you get from writing teachers uh, and writing books is write what you know. Write what you know. I hate that, right? I have to live with this brain 24 hours a day. So why do I want to write a book or a play that could last months or years about this brain or what's in this brain? I don't want to do that. I want to write what I don't know. And Hilary Mental is a good example of it. Her first novel was all about the French Revolution. She wrote it in the 1970s when she was in so much pain and and writing about the French Revolution was a great escape for her because it gave her an escape from her mind, right? And she was writing what she didn't know, which means she had to do a lot of research, right? And although she has although her first two novels that got published were semi-autobiographical or they were not they were stories that were inspired by her own life. The novels that gave her the biggest breakthrough, Wolf Hall, wasn't about write what you know. It's about write what you don't know. She immersed herself in the research of English history and she wrote two great masterpieces. Maybe a, th a third masterpiece is coming. Now, that's the real lesson here. Write what you don't know. Having said that, we are living in the 2020s. Now, there are a lot of people call outrage seekers, right? They will say, if you write about what you don't know, they will say cultural appropriation. So let's say you have an idea for a novel set in Japan. Yeah, Japan in the 1940s. And it's about a boy. Uh, it's a coming of age story. And it's about a boy who thinks he is gay. And then he comes out as gay, right? And the, the problem here is you are not Japanese and you are not gay. Should you write that novel? My answer to you is yes, you should. If you have a great story to tell, 
go ahead and do it. The outrage seekers will always be there. They will always look for something to criticize. But the key thing is this. Just make sure you tell a great story about that boy in Japan in a time of war who comes out as a gay person. Right? It could be an amazing story. I will read it. Just make sure you know what the stereotypes are, especially the negative stereotypes. And don't perpetuate those stereotypes. It's that simple. Just tell a great story. Right. So this is why I really would advise write what you don't know. The fifth most important lesson here is keep things simple. Now, Hilary Mantel's earlier novels uh, didn't really have a clear story, but she still succeeded. It was a craft. It was a skill that she had to learn. But when it came to Wolf Hall, and if you look at the first two novels and now the, the third one, which completes the trilogy, the, re, uh, the one thing stands out, which is the simplicity. Right at the spine of the narrative, she, he, she keeps everything simple. So if I had to pitch the series, I would do it as follows. It's about a boy who leaves home and he can't get back, but he's very ambitious. He has to make something of himself. He has a sense of destiny. He thinks he's going to be great. So what does he do? He's got nothing. What does he do? And the whole, all three novels about that from a boy who becomes an iconic man in a major country in the world. That's as simple as that. Now, when I first read uh, Wolf Hall in 2009, the way I looked at it was probably different from other people. In 2008, an, uh, a movie came which was made by a great British filmmaker. And that became one of my favorite movies of all time uh, because I could relate to a lot of things in it. So anyway, so when I read Wolf Hall, one of the things that attracted me and one of the qualities that are really universal about Wolf Hall is that it's so simple. The story there is simple. It's universal. It's about a boy who's got nothing, who gets something, who, who becomes a somebody. And to me, if I had to pitch that story now, it's really a slumdog millionaire in 16th century England. It's as simple as that. And that's how I see it. So it's about keeping things simple. When you keep things simple, then you can hang a lot of complex ideas and scenes on the spine. That's a huge lesson. It's harder to learn. It took Hilary Mantel over 10 years and, and those 10,000 glad billion hours to really get it right. But now she's a master. Now, if you want to watch that video that I made about Slumdog Millionaire and what that means to me, you can find the link to it in the description below or in there. You'll also find all the sources that I use to make this video and to make my study of Hilary Mantel. And this is something that I will be doing for the rest of my life, I'm sure, because she is an important novelist. So here comes the important question for you. Who is your greatest novelist of this moment? And what are the five lessons you learn from that learning process? Um, if you're not a YouTuber, you can still answer this question in the comment section. Tell me. Now, fans of Ian McEwan might be shaking their heads now. They will be saying the greatest uh, novelist in England is Ian McEwan. Now, if you think that, make your own video and state your case. Or you can join me in the comment section where, where you can quarrel with me. Just make sure to bring your A game. Everybody else, if you're a booktuber, you go and make your video. And then uh, now I'm going to tag five booktubers. These are the five booktubers that who, who these are the five booktubers who who keep up to date with all the latest development in publishing. They keep um, they they read the novelists who are hot or not at the moment. So I hope all these five booktubers can make their videos and then pick five other booktubers who can go on to do this tag. So. First up is Sophie in Portal in the Pages, then Jasmine, and then Britta Bola, and Eric Carl Anderson, and of course, Steve Donahue. So these are my five, five booktubers. Now, if I haven't picked you, just go and do it. In fact, everyone who watches this video, everyone in booktube and authortube, you are tagged. Go and do your video. All I ask is that when you make a video, uh, put a link to this original tag so they can get to watch the remit. And also, if you do a video, uh, send me a message on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook to tell me that you've done it because I watch a lot of YouTube, especially ones outside this niche. So I might miss out on it. So if you do a video of this tag, send me a message or an email so they, then I'll watch. Now, if you got a lot of value out of this video, 
do please click that subscribe button and the notification sign so every time I, I every time I upload a video like this you can get to watch it as soon as possible and I will be making more videos like this in the next few months and also I have a question for you which of the five lessons resonated with you that connected with you now if you haven't read a book by Hilary Mantel before I recommend you start with giving up the ghost her memoir uh, because now this is not a guidebook on writing uh, we in fiction we hear the uh, term we hear the phrase show don't tell this is a good example of Hilary Mantel showing the life that she had to endure to become an established novelist now, this goes up until 2003. It doesn't cover the Wolf Hall era, but it has lots of inspiring moments that I learned. This is a book that I reread many, a lot of times. And uh, to me, it is up there with some of the other great literary memoirs of the last 50 years, like uh, Speak Memory by Nabokov, uh, John Updike Self-Consciousness, and uh, Experience by Martin Amis. Well, do you have your favorite memoir? Tell me. Now, I want to leave uh, this video with a great passage in her memoir, uh, which shows so much about all the qualities and the lessons that I discuss in this video. I'm not writing to solicit any special sympathy. People survive much worse and never put pen to paper. I'm writing in order to take charge of the story of my childhood and my childlessness. And in order to locate myself, if not within a body, then in the narrow space between one letter and the next, between the lines where the ghosts of meaning are. Spirit needs a house and lodges where it can. You don't kill yourself just because you need loose covers rather than frocks. There are other people who, like me, have had the roots of their personality torn up. You need to find yourself in the maze of social expectation, the thickets of memory, just which bits of you are left intact. I have been so mauled by medical procedures, so sabotaged and made over, so thin and so fat, that sometimes I feel that each morning it is necessary to write myself into being. Even if the writing is aimless doodling that no one will ever read or the diary that no one can see till I'm dead. When you have committed enough words to paper, you feel you have a spine stiff enough to stand up in the wind. But when you stop writing, you find that's all you are, a spine, a row of rattling vertebrae dried out like an old quill pen.